All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, full RTD Accountability Committee meeting on March 8th. And um, we will get going and begin with public comment to see if there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to us for up to um, three minutes. Theoretically, I have the capability of seeing anybody who raises their hands. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm not seeing anybody. But Melinda, tell you, tell me if I'm uh, missing anybody. I don't think I am. Uh, no, you are correct. I do not see anyone uh, from the public raising their hand for public comment. And I'd also say I don't see an icon I can click on to raise my hand or a you, menu that I can get to that would let me raise my hand. If you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, it might reactivate the bar that allows you to mute, stop video, raise hand. Yep, I see that one and I don't see a raise hand. Huh. Hey, um, I'm very familiar with Zoom. So if you go over to participants, um, you'll see at the very bottom of uh, um, three different little options, three little dots. So you see invite, mute me, and then three little dots. If you hit the three little dots, that takes you to raise your hand. I don't see three little dots. But let's, get, let's move on. I don't want to delay this. Maybe offline I could get some you, you can physically wave your hand wildly and I'll see you run. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You can we'll do it the old fashioned <laughs> way. All right. Well, so then moving on, we, apparently we don't have anybody to participate in public comments. So I'll draw your attention to the meeting summary. Anybody have any um, needed edits to that or is that good to go for folks? I'm seeing a thumbs up. All right, well then we will move on to the co-chair report. Um, the Probably the biggest news from my end, and then I'll turn it over to my co-chair, is that um, the RTD um, legislative recommendations that we made have been introduced and it's House Bill 1186, I believe. And I can send around the, we, I think we can send around or include a version of what was introduced if folks haven't seen it or you can go and get it off the General Assembly website. Uh, it was what we suggested to them with a few minor tweaks they, well, that occurred in the drafting process. The, the title of the bill was narrowed so that it could really just focus on um, our recommendations, which are focused on easing restrictions in RTD to give RTD the flexibility to make um, some uh, operations modifications that might help increase ridership and revenues. As you recall, I'm getting rid of the revenue uh, requirement for um, fare box revenue requirement uh, uh, lifting the restrictions on their ability to charge for parking, um, uh, easing up on restrictions around TOD at RTD stations, and allowing them to uh, contract more easily with local governments and um, uh, nonprofit organizations, and adjusting that cap so that they were more free to make those um, partnerships. Uh, the one thing that we had suggested, which was exempting them from local parking restrictions at TOD developments on their properties, we ended up uh, taking that out because it was gonna cause too much controversy with local governments and we hope to um, achieve uh, the goal of flexibility there without having to put it in legislation. So that's the status. I don't think it's, it was just introduced so it hasn't been scheduled yet that I'm aware of, but we'll keep you posted as it is. So that's my co-chair update. Let me ask my fellow co-chair, Crystal, if she has anything she wanted to report. Only thing is um, we've gotten a, a couple additional requests to present um, RTD accountability stuff. So um, as we 
um, engage in those conversations. We'll be sure to give you all an update um, there. Wonderful. So if there's no questions, we'll move on to the subcommittee updates and we will begin with, wait, I see Ron has a hand raised. Madam Co-Chair, I just wanna let you know, everyone else know that I did post a link to um, the House bill to, um, gosh, no, I forget the name, House bill 1186, the RTD uh, bill in the, in the chat. So anyone can access it from there. Thank you so much for doing that. All right, Rhett, would you be willing to give your update now? Okay. <laughs> so on our February 17th meeting, we received a summary of the 2021 staffing levels and staff recalls from CEO Deborah Johnson, resulting from the latest federal COVID relief funding. Tanya Edelman from North Highland Consultants reported on our requested assessment of RTD's administrative overhead relative to peer transit agencies. Elise Jones provided a summary of the planned S8 State Highway 117 BRT project. And Ron Pastor summarized RTD's most recent budgets and how they have changed. Doug McLeod provided a status update on RTD's debt refinancing, which should result in about $80 million in savings. We concluded by reviewing our work plan focus areas needed to complete our objectives by May 31st, including the challenges of the fast tracks unfinished corridors. On our February 3rd meeting, Rebecca White led a discussion of goals and objectives for a public facing RTD dashboard and some of the opportunities and challenges it presents. Ron Papsdorf led a discussion of the remaining four unfinished corridors of the original Fast Tracks voter approved initiative. And Rutt Bridges presented a financial analysis of the challenges presented by the Line B Northwest Rail and the large subsidies that RTD would assume upon its completion. The alternative of aggressively pursuing bus rapid transit combined with transit opportunities based on emerging technologies was also discussed. That's it. Thank you, Rut. Any questions for Rut on the goings on of the finance subcommittee? All right, then we will move on to the governance subcommittee. Julie? All right, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. So um, we actually had to cancel our February 19th meeting um, just for scheduling conflicts. And um, really what we did do is we sent out our draft <laughs> sub-regional service council recommendations to the group to consider and review. Um, and so we're gonna continue to work on tweaking those final recommendations. And it's actually gonna go to um, the governance committee probably for discussion on March 15th because um, we didn't get to have a chance to talk about it at our last meeting, which was last Monday, March 1st. That's when we started the partnership conversation. And so we had um, presentations from Boulder County, um, Transit, uh, Lone Tree, um, RTD had a couple presentations and via. So it was a, a full meeting of great presentations and, and a great start to our multi- <laughs> subcommittee conversation regarding partnerships um, with RTD. And so uh, we weren't able to get to our final uh, sub-regional service council recommendations, but we'll get to that. Um, we'll circle back around for the March 15th. And that's all I got, thanks. Thanks, Julie. Any questions for Julie on governance subcommittee matters? If not, all right, let's move today on the operations committee, subcommittee. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, before I give my report, I just want to share out, um, I entered this in the chat for the panelists, but Melinda, it seemed like there's some confusion, at least from some community organizations, whether the meeting is on Zoom or go to webinar. I just want to point that out. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if we, we may want to revisit that for discussion here in a little bit. Um, I will go ahead and transition to my report. Uh, so on the February 17th, at the February 17th meeting, um, the operations committee received a second presentation from the state auditor, 
um, from the state auditor's report on fares and fare box recovery, the committee discussed potential recommendations, including assessing the cost of accessor ride and just getting a better understanding of how um, how our recommendation may, may come together. Um, we concluded with a discussion on potential measures um, to address operational opportunities, including a dashboard and what metrics we may wanna explore as part of that conversation. Um, we learned during that conversation from Deborah Johnson that this um, aligns very nicely with um, some of the work that she is doing internally within RTD to get clarity around um, goals and, and metrics and potential opportunities to really align the vision of the, the organization. So I think um, we are going to continue that work in terms of um, identifying potential metrics under the umbrellas of efficiency and then effectiveness. Um, one other thing that came out of this meeting is uh, we needed some understanding of comparison on peer agencies and what might be happening there. Um, so on March 3rd, um, we received an overview on Accessoride, Human Services, Transportation, and Dr. Cog's Ride Alliance Partnership. Um, committee member uh, Kristen Trustman also did an amazing job of presenting an outline of Accessoride and comparison on other um, Accessoride services from, from agencies across the region. Um, that was a lot of hard work, and so I just want to thank you, Kristen, um, for, for doing that and really that heavy lift and sharing out what your findings are. Um, so we are going to continue our work uh, alongside the finance committee in identifying a potential external facing dashboard as a potential recommendation. So that's my report. Thanks, Daya. And I will echo, echo the thanks to Kristen. That was a really uh, impressive analysis. So we appreciate that work. Any questions for Daya on her report? Um, I want to echo um, what Daya put in the chat about the call when I tried to get in. I, I actually logged in Zoom and webinar both. So those links are out there for this meeting. So I don't know if we want to um, circle back at some point for public comment to see if anybody, since there were not very many members of the public when we actually went through that. But before we do that, um, let's move on to the RTD update, which will be provided by General Manager Johnson. And as always, we're grateful that she's with us. So good morning and thank you very much, uh, Chair Jones. Um, appreciate that and happy International Women's Day. Um, what I plan to do this morning is just touch upon four items and Chair Jones talked about uh, the state bill, but I'll just expand from the RTD's perspective. Want to share with you uh, our enhanced stakeholder engagement uh, process, talk about the COVID relief fund um, as it relates to the recommendations we receive, and then just briefly touch upon um, our efforts as it relates to Northwest Rail and what we endeavor to do in the upcoming weeks. So uh, with that brief introduction, delving into um, uh, House Bill uh, 1186 as it relates to enabling um, RTD uh, to have greater flexibility in reference to its daily operations. Tomorrow, uh, March 9th, the RTD board will be holding a special board meeting whereby um, the board will discuss the bill and take a position on said bill. Um, as you all know, um, I, along with members of my team and specifically the board, have been working closely with you all as the accountability committee and the bill sponsors to provide input that help inform the draft bill. So I want to thank you all for the collaborative effort in that with us being able to opine and speak to our core business about service delivery and how this can enhance um, our abilities to be the optimal transit network it was intended to be. Uh, secondly, speaking briefly about our enhanced engagement process, uh, some of you may be aware when I first assumed this position, I made it a point um, as one of my core elements to ensure that we were listening more than we were speaking and being intimately engaged so we could garner a better understanding of customer pain points um, to be more empathetic to the needs of those utilizing the system. With that being said, as part of this enhanced approach, uh, just uh, the latter part of January, early February, um, the team embarked on stakeholder listening sessions, and we're really leveraging the June service change, but keeping in mind that while this may be the genesis of all of this, the intent is to have this stakeholder engagement be 
ever green in the sense that it's going to be a continuous loop. It doesn't have to be about a service change. It needs to be about the myriad of issues, concerns, and impacts that we as a transit agency need to be cognizant of so we can optimize the service programs and, and um, other uh, elements that we provide to the vast public, um, which would be a benefit to us. With that as the backdrop, we had virtual listening sessions with five geographical sectors that were developed based upon general travel patterns throughout the region. And we had more than 150 stakeholders participate in the meetings and provided feedback on an array of topics. Um, we're using that information as we draft the service plan. So it's not a fait complete. The operative word is draft the service plan. Um, and that will be presented to the RTD board tomorrow. And that's just what the draft is. Keeping in mind that we are going to leverage our traditional process of having public input as well, um, in the sense of having public hearings. And then the intent is staff will review and refine the engagement process as necessary as I indicated at the outset of my remarks regarding this area. Next, I'd like to touch briefly upon um, the CARISA funds, as we know those to be the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, um, recognizing that this body gave us some recommendations. It's anticipated we will receive $203.4 million at the time of this report right now. We still have yet to receive the specific guidance from FTA, but we are confident that that will be forthcoming and we'll draw down on the funds and go through the application process as we did previously with the first round of relief funding, which was the CARES Act. So in relation to the recommendations put forward, um, we agree with that recommendation number one, that we are committed to continuing a transparent process for communicating clear priorities for use of the funds. Secondly, um, looking at um, the completed strategic recall of previously, uh, reduced uh, workforce employees that were impacted adversely. Uh, we have done that entire recall effort on both the full-time and part-time um, side of the house. We are continuing to support partnerships with other transit service providers to supplement our fixed route and paratransit services. And we are committed to continuing efforts to optimize adoption and improve ease of our past system. And I'd be remiss to say, um, you know, we wholeheartedly agree that there are opportunities to improve uh, flexibility with EcoPass and the LIFT program. And then additionally, um, recognizing that there were other suggestions put forth that we've received related to CRISA funds, and we await the comprehensive recommendations in this uh, body's July report as relates to uh, suggestions relative to creating fair structures and leveraging partnerships. Um, as you all know, one example of this uh, was something that transpired in November in reference to the recent pilot PRAS program with Auraria. And, um, you know, we're getting good feedback on that, but we have to do our due diligence in reference to a fair equity analysis, which we're uh, about to launch uh, within the next couple of days uh, to discern uh, the path forward with that. And then also recognizing that we need to reevaluate the fare structure and continue to look at opportunities for right sizing uh, or right pricing, I should say, uh, fares. And um, the other recommendation that had come full circle through this body was the, the state's COVID vaccination efforts. Uh, we have been working with a myriad of different partners and recognizing that this is um, a process that's been evergreen and fluid recognizing that uh, there has been some hiccups, not on the part of anybody specifically, but just from a national perspective. And so uh, my team and I have been uh, very well engaged with that and you know, partnered with SEL Health to provide free shuttles, most recently just this weekend for the second doses and working with a myriad of other entities as we try to streamline how we could leverage that going forward. And last but not least, recognizing that we did hold a, a special study session uh, regarding the Northwest Rail Line. Uh, I've been working with my team. It's our intent to come back to the board. Right now, it looks as if it'll be April 13th and doing some um, a very targeted uh, engagement activities to garner better understandings of what stakeholders would like to see as we go forward and put forth that recommendation. So Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity. That concludes my report this morning.
Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, are there questions for the general manager? We're a quiet bunch this morning. Drink that coffee, people. <laughs> Thank you so much then, Deborah. We appreciate that update. And I'm just gonna um, circle back to see um, if there is uh, anybody that is now on the call that would like to, to participate in public comment. We didn't get any takers earlier, but we wanna recognize there were some technical difficulties with folks getting on the call. So I just wanna re-extend that invitation to see if there's anybody on the call now that would want to speak to us. If so, please raise your hand. And I think I have one raised hand that um, looks like Angie. Well, did you? Can you hear me, Elise? Yes. Okay. I couldn't. I couldn't see you for a minute. There you are. Um, we would love to hear from you if you have something to say to us this morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Accountability Committee. Thank you for letting me um, ask a question and make a comment, actually. Um, I just wanted to share with all of you that last week, RTD partnered with Stride Health and Channel 9 by providing our parking structure at Wadsworth for a drive through vaccination site, which I think is very exciting. But secondarily, um, our general manager has been working diligently, diligently with the CDC um, on the National Western Stock Show providing bus service to vaccination. So I'm very, very excited about our partnerships um, doing the inoculations across the community. Thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing that to our attention. It, it's certainly in keeping with uh, recommendations from the committee on that. Is there anybody else um, that would like to speak to us and provide public comment? Elise, this is Melinda. Um, just wanted to say one thing. Uh, if there is anyone who has called in on the phone, uh, they can raise their hand by hitting star nine. And then, um, you know, we can call on them based on the last three digits of their phone number. And then we just need to unmute them. And then they'll need to unmute themselves by hitting star six. It's a little bit of a process, but we can get them there. <laughs> Thanks, Melinda, for highlighting that opportunity. Is there anybody on the phone that would like to speak to us? I'm not seeing anybody. Melinda, do you see anybody? I do not. All right. Well, then we will close public comment for the second time. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Crystal, to run the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Elise. And thank you so much for um, incorporating the additional public comment period. Um, and of course, anybody is able to um, connect with us directly um, should there be any um, input after this uh, time frame um, during our meetings. Uh, our next discussion item is a partnership round table wrap up uh, by Mr. Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. And good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> when Elise mentioned everybody's kind of quiet this morning, kind of rethinking the genius of 8.30 Monday morning meetings. Um, but uh, we'll all get there, one copy, one copy in for sure. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much. I want to thank uh, everybody who had an opportunity to join us for the special governance subcommittee meeting last week. And um, uh, subcommittee chair Julie Mullica, she mentioned exactly, uh, you know, what the content of that meeting was. I just wanted to just, for one, I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware that the presentations are included in your packet, um, so that if you were not able to attend. Um, you have access to those. And quite frankly, if you were able to attend too, those, those are available. Um, and I particularly, uh, you know, wanted to give a shout out to, to uh, Mayor Malay, her presentation, which was great, the staff did. We, we had some technical difficulties and couldn't get it up on the screen at the time, but it looks great, Jackie, just so you know. Um, so we did have presentations, as, as Julie mentioned, from Boulder, Denver, Via, Lone Tree, and a couple from RTD. Um, and I, I think everybody would agree, those that were present, that, that the, the major theme of that was the importance of, of partnerships, right, in, in, in the delivery of service um, via RTD or from, from other sources. Um, 
Boulder really, really elaborated on uh, leveraging local dollars with RTD dollars to provide some additional buy-up services. Um, they talked a little bit about their the hop and some other very successful services that they provide in, in, the, in the city and county of Boulder. Um, Denver uh, really talked highly about the partnerships with RTD, whether that be uh, for bus and bus stop improvements or uh, transit only uh, bus lanes. They said those, quite frankly, wouldn't be possible without the partnership that they have with, uh, with RTD as well and, and other partners. Um, Lone Tree, they, they've, their presentation went, went a little different direction. Um, and and um, what they did as part with their uh, Lone Tree link on demand service is provide kind of a void in local service that, that, that they had or the, the need for local service. Um, it's a it's a um, it's a citywide circulator, and they've had quite a bit of success with that. Um, you see, funding for that comes pri primarily from the city and Denver South, with some other private investors, um, with stops along the way of that service. Um, Via did a great job in, in in highlighting some of the paratransit work that they're doing, um, associated primarily with uh, the work that they're doing with Dr. Cog on the on uh, transportation for older adults. Um, they also talked about this growing need and work that they're doing with small town circulators. I thought that was quite interesting and I'm looking to explore that a little further. Um, and RTD, um, they mentioned they had a couple different presentations as, uh, as um, subcommittee chair Mulligan mentioned. One was on specifically on paratransit. They talked about the accessor ride service, the excessive taxi or excessive cab service. Um, and talked about the role of technology plays in the delivery of that service. And also meant they, they, uh, they also had a presentation on microtransit, um, referring to um, you know, the, the flex ride service that they provide within throughout the, the entire service area, um, some application developments that they're working with some private sector folks, and also mentioned a couple of pilots that they've, they've been in, um, in, uh, involved with through the years. One, the Lyft pilot, down in, San, down in Centennial and, um, and the chariot pilot that they did with DU. And I think there was another one in Denver too, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but so yeah, it was a great conversation, but I think what I wanted to point out today is that as, uh, as Julie mentioned, this is not the last conversation we're gonna have about partnerships um, at the March 15th meeting. We also plan on, on uh, staff presenting um, some, uh, a peer review of, uh, of um, uh, microtransit that we are seeing throughout the country, some of the some of the uh, ways that um, other regions are are utilizing the TNCs and and other services of the world. So um, if you're interested in that and you don't sit on the subcommittee, where we uh, we certainly welcome you to that to that conversation because um, I know you guys don't get enough of us already, right? So the so that that's it. Um, if there's any questions or comments, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Um, if not, again, the presentations are included in your packet as well as on our website. Thank you, Madam Chair. Crystal, I had a question or a request. As I recall, part of our conversation, a lot of us asked um, participants on what they viewed as sort of the obstacles for more partnerships as that's the piece I think that relates to the work of this committee is how do we facilitate we know there's some great partnerships out there and we want to have more of them and, and what what prevents us I don't know Doug if you can um, recap any of the responses I heard um, sort of a, a culture of, of, of partnership is being one and or needing that and then also funding but I don't know if you want to report in on that piece of it yeah, the, those are quite frankly the two that, that I was writing down as you were talking. And oh. yeah, I think you're right. I mean, funding is always an obstacle, right? Um, you know, if we had all the funding in the world, we wouldn't have many problems. But it's, uh, but you're right. And I think um, that there is a culture of partnerships throughout this community now, anyway, right? I just think it's a, it's a it's a matter of you know kind of formalizing and you know. Uh, providing a venue to have those conversations about partnerships. And that's, that gets back to um, some of the conversations that this, the governance subcommittee is having about the local service councils, right? And, and providing that, 
that opportunity, that venue for, to, to have those conversations and just think about some innovative solutions that, that come with that. And I guess I'm, I'm curious to that end if um, Deb or others from RTD have thoughts on, um, you know, as we look towards the future, if there are um, ideas that you have on how to better facilitate that. Is it the, it, is it the local service councils? Is it leveraging local funds? Is it, you know, changing the point person at RTD? All of a sudden, there's all sorts of hands. I'm trying to facilitate a conversation here, so um, just curious what other folks are thinking. I think I saw Dea first, so I'll let you go, and then we'll go move on to Jack. Yeah. Um, thank you, Crystal, and uh, Elise. I appreciate the 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 questions to kind of spur a little bit more <laughs> conversation and dialogue. I think one question that I had, you know, as I reflected on the partnership conversation is um, how might this recommendation be sitting with other municipalities and other cities? Um, it, it was great to hear from Denver and Boulder. These are also fair, like the two largest cities in our region. And I think of other communities like the city of Westminster or even North Glen, Thornton. And I, I, I just kind of want to get a better sense of maybe how these um, municipalities might be thinking about um, partnerships or how, how have they used partnerships with RTD in the past? And is that a potential recommendation that we want to incorporate within the committee, whatever committee recommendation that we, we include, just an acknowledgement that depending on the municipality size, their budget and their own allocations, that partnerships are going to look different. Um, and we just need to acknowledge that. So I, I wanted to offer that um, as just my own reflection after the conversation. Thank you, Dea. Uh, Jackie. Thanks. I, um, I want to speak to kind of flexibility. I think that is something that local governments would like to see more of from um, RTD, flexibility to access and partnerships. So for example, uh, the Denver South TMA, which I chair, has had a number of initiatives with um, partnering with Lyft and partnering with Uber actually to, um, to try and solve that last mile problem or the accessibility problem. So I think it, it, from, from the TMA's perspective that I represent and, and Lone Tree, having a set of metrics that, that RTD wants to achieve and needs to achieve based on um, you know, what is required of them and, and having dollars then available for local communities to partner with RTD to, to accept, access those dollars and provide those services. So the Lone Tree link um, only operates within the city of Lone Tree, but if we could, uh, if we could access uh, FlexRide dollars, accomplish the goals of FlexRide and de deliver better service to all, I think we would, both parties would see some cost savings. So I think um, that's a real concrete example of identify the metrics, identify funding that's available for a local community and then work with us to try and achieve common goals. So I think Rut was next, but um, I, I just wanted to see if uh, Deborah Johnson, if you wanted to add anything um, at this point to some of the comments that have been made. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. So I think there's a couple of things, and, and thank you very much, Chair Jones, uh, for throwing out this question to stimulate the discussion. Um, I think, if anything, there needs to be a collective understanding of what we mean by partnerships, recognizing that I am totally amenable to said partnerships, but there needs to be uh, a way in which we can oversee and manage and engage these partnerships. I have heard in my short time here that we do things in a myriad of different ways. We have intergovernmental agreements that may not be done in the same manner across the board. Um, I think that without trying to sound like a monolithic bureaucratic organization, that's something that needs to be consistent as we go forward, right? So that doesn't become the cog in the machine. Recognizing that RTD is embarking upon 
um, creating alignment around what we envision our uh, priorities to be, that should be the basic foundation upon which we make decisions relative to the betterment of the region as a whole. So when we talk about metrics and we talk about priorities, those need to fall within the auspices of those. So then it becomes more or less um, an opportunity for all recognizing that we've put out the rules of engagement from the outset. So there's no question about would this be permissible as we go forward. And I think what I am endeavoring to do, and this is going to take some time, and I don't mean years, but I mean, you know, at least the next few months is to shore that up, or perhaps there is a point person in the organization whereby it's funneled through. So we have an understanding, okay, we have this IGA with this person or this entity, here we have the criteria, this meets our um, strategic priorities and falls within the auspices of the goal of, you know, improving safety and service quality, if that's something that we come up with. So just a broad brush, um, those are my uh, viewpoints as relates to, to, you know, creating some kind of um, structure for lack of a better word around the partnerships, but want to uh, let you all know that yes, that's something that I believe would enhance us as a region, leverage dollars as we go forward, optimize um, service options and mobility options in various parts of the region. Because as I said before, it's not a cookie cutter approach. So we need to be very in tune with the needs of the customer segments and the areas in which we're trying to improve mobility access. So thank you very much. Brett, did you want to chime in? And thank you. You're muted. Yeah, I, I did want to comment on uh, both both what uh, Daya and Mayor Malay had had said about the importance of this issue of creating some sort of uniform models for first last mile. Uh, you know, as we, as we move forward, assuming the legislature moves ahead on the on the uh, proposed uh, bill that ridership is going to be the measurement by which RTD is evaluated to a much larger degree. We have had a collapse in ridership as a result of COVID, but we now have an opportunity as, as we start to, to get past this, if we look ahead a little bit, not just where we are right now, but where we will be in a year or two, it, it really, these partnerships take time to get in place. And we ought to think about where we want to be in a year or two in terms of our ability to serve a lot of the underserved communities that we have today. That first last mile issue is a huge issue. And there are a lot of, you wanna call it market opportunity, but it's really human opportunity to provide ways of getting them good access to all of the transit opportunities that RTD represents. And this goes for things like if we if we look at expanding BRT, we need to think about things like how does how does Longmont draw people into that BRT more effectively, and how do some of those other communities along the way in in some of the existing BRT that we have, how do we really uh, connect to those folks, and how do we provide those opportunities? And I think partnerships with TNCs are are a great model for being able to do that. But we need to do it in a way that it is, it can be duplicated in other places without too much brain damage and putting those partnerships together. So it's both a finance and an operations uh, issue. So hopefully I hope that, that we'll be able to work well with Daya and her committee as well uh, in the finance committee. Yeah. Yeah, good point on the intersection, Rhett. Uh, Julie. Awesome, thank you. So I, I wanted to circle back to, I guess, Dea's question about what are, you know, some other cities looking at doing or how can they um, utilize partnerships better? And I did want to raise um, one thing that the North Area Transportation Alliance was able to uh, accomplish, um, which was a flex ride service from Wagon Road North up to the new Amazon um, distribution center, also, also to the St. Anthony's North Hub campus and some of the shopping areas up there in Thornton. Uh, 
there wasn't service. And for those who were working at Amazon, um, they didn't have any way of getting <laughs> north. And that was a problem. And so like the workforce transit issue was um, one that we were able to solve via a partnership. Um, but moving forward, I think one of the major things that we're gonna need to be thinking about um, is how do we, you know, where is the money to support um, some of these communities in, you know, collecting data and doing analysis on better ways to meet the needs of their community? Um, I, I know that that's definitely a need up here, especially my city, you know, we're a little smaller and we're surrounded by two large giants. Um, so we do have to think regionally about how to move um, our residents here in Northland. And so we work really closely with Thornton Westminster and we have great relationships with that, but it's how do we as a group collaboratively come together, um, collect information and um, really able to get uh, a better perspective on the needs of our community. And so I'm hoping that, you know, if a type of um, community service council or something was implemented, um, that could help us, but there's still gonna be a need for funding. And I think that that is always gonna be our largest hurdle is how do we even get the money um, to do these types of analyses? And I think that that's definitely something that, you know, <laughs> is on our mind of, you know, how do we even start this process and, and how do we support communities like mine through this? So that was just my feedback, thanks. Thanks, Dea. Lynn? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, a couple of things that I think that I have had both my uh, um, partners in the staff at Boulder, at the city of Boulder and Boulder County comment that uh, they're seeing a new flexibility on some of these things in terms of partnering with RTD on eco passes and um, and other projects. And uh, I will give a lot of credit to our new general manager for that because I think uh, those things are being encouraged now. So I'm encouraged by that. I think th um, that in terms of uh, Mayor Malay's comments, uh, the board has had a lot of conversations about, and the staff has worked too, uh, about uh, how we partner in order to lower costs, accessorize and other things. And, and that area is one that is, uh, is ripe for for more work. Um, and uh, I think a lot of these comments just go, go back to more structure of the process and how we set it up. This, I think the stakeholder meetings that were held recently to, to start the service process, which is a change, of course, rather than bringing new plans to people, um, the staff has gone out to, to engage. And, and as uh, Ms. Johnson said, a, a, an evergreen and ongoing process. And some of these things may be part of that conversation too, as we um, start to develop those relationships better and, and can talk about some of these partnerships. Thanks. Uh -oh. It looks like we lost Crystal for a minute. I'll just step in and say, Doug, I think you were next up with your hand raised and we'll see if we can get Crystal back in. Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Lynn kind of stole my thunder a little bit. I, I wanted to uh, just, I, I wanted to mention the kind of quadrant um, listening sessions that RTD had recently done. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the, that the new general manager, um, that that didn't go unnoticed. And I think it was a good first step as, as um, you know, Elise has mentioned in the, in the governance subcommittee, um, at least a, once, once or twice, is that, you know, the necessity of getting in on the front end and having those conversations with service staff and that. So, so uh, General Manager Johnson, thank you very much for that. I think it, it was appreciated by all. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was something related to what Julie said and the extension of the service up to the Amazon complex and the like, um, you know, that, that was funded at least in part with Dr. Cog monies. And I think we're beginning to look at, you know, different ways of how we allocate funding. We're really looking for leveraging opportunities. And that's what I've seen in some of the um, uh, Dr. Cog sub-regional work that, we, that, that we've had conversations about related to our transportation improvement program. So I think there's more and more opportunities and, and uh, I'm sure we'll be exploring that in our next HIP cycle. Thank you. 
Sorry, team, I lost connection for a, a few minutes there. So um, Lynn, R Doug, were you responding to Lynn's comments? Okay. I was, yeah. Okay, just uh, making sure I'm tracking with the conversation. <laughs> um, I have a limited view on my phone about who's next, but I see that Elise has her hand raised. Thanks, Crystal. And yeah, I jumped in and, and uh, called on on uh, Doug while you were I, uh, technologically indi indisposed. Um, and, and just to pile on, I do think, I, I also wanna say that I've, I've heard, heard and seen um, a new flexibility at RTD um, so thanks uh, to General Manager Johnson on really just sort of, I think, giving permission to RTD to go out and to work directly with communities. And I think that's the direction we want to head and foster and encourage. Um, I, with, re comments, the, with regards to your comments about creating structure, I agree and want to merge what you said with what Jackie said about flexibility. Um, because the partnerships won't be one size fits all. Everybody should ha have access to creating partnerships with RTD and other players around mobility, um, but they're gonna take different flavors. And I guess the other, the other piece is if funding is the consistent um, thread or lack thereof through all of these conversations, how do we get everybody involved to um, think creatively about where the money can come from? and one logical place is to ask our private sector partners to step up when um, large employers um, have a demand with um, a workforce getting to their jobs. That's a logical place to say, hey, it's in your benefit to partner with RTD, Dr. Cog, local communities to help um, pay, pay into the, the mobility bucket. So I think there's in, uh, increasing ways that we should um, look at expanding who, who helps pay in for mobility? And you've heard me say this before. And if that mobility happens to be um, a, a emission-free or low emission alternative, so it helps with attainment on ozone and it helps reduce climate emissions, maybe there can be contributions um, as part of that, uh, being part of that solution as well. So I think we just really have to broaden um, how we think about how we pay for transportation and, and these partnerships. Uh, thank you, Elise. Um, I, I'm going to uh, make a few comments as well. I think we were kind of on a similar wavelength and in, in wanting to ask a few more questions on the partnership piece and then um, give the general manager an opportunity to chime in. But, um, you know, just to your comments, um, General Manager Johnson, about um, the need to define what partnership looks like, you know, kind of have the internal staff structure to be able to support that. Uh, I hear that loud and clear, having to do that um, my day job as well on, on strategic partnerships. Um, my question is, how uh, how do we follow the I guess the evolution of that 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 conversation um, around defining partnerships? Are there going to be what does that process look like? Is there going to be public input. Um, I think this kind of doves, dovetails into um, Co-Chair Jones's comments around, you know, defining and, and having flexibility about what that looks like. I, I wonder if you could give us a, a, some of your thoughts around that. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Co-Chair. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to elaborate somewhat, recognizing we can't do anything in a vacuum because I don't understand all the pain points and I'd be remiss if in fact I took that approach. So basically garnering some understanding of what that may be is imperative going forward. Uh, one thing for certain, um, gosh, last, last month at the RTD board meeting, I talked about my intent of having a uh, discussion section with the board on what I'm qualifying as the road to recovery. While this is not specific to RTD's accountability committee, committee's work, they're for certain is a nexus with it, because as we talk about improving the organization to maximize a myriad of things, this is one element coming full circle. So while I have ideas, I need to ensure that I am working in tandem with the policy body of RTD being the board of directors. So around all of that, it's basically taking it through the design thinking process, first and foremost, being empathetic to what the pain points are. And I hear a lot of those, you know, in the context of this discussion here and 
independent discussions I've had with other stakeholders as well. So basically starting with that first you know, step in design thinking is being empathetic, understanding the pain points. Then secondly, identify the problem for which we're trying to solve. And so that's what I intend to do with the board. Also have conversations, which I've already started to do in my uh, team has had conversations as well. And then it is more or less, once you define what the problem is, it's ideating. What are the ideas and creative solutions that we have? And then the next step in that process is, you know, you know, developing a prototype and then piloting it. And if any of you are familiar with the design thinking process, those things can be done, you know, on a parallel track as we go forward. So those are my thoughts because I'd be remiss to do it outside of that. Because I think if anything, we do have to be flexible and agile. And thank you so much, Chair Jones, for saying what you said when I talked about having, you know, some form of a structure, recognizing there is flexibility within, but I'm saying as we funnel them through, so nobody feels as if they've been treated in a disparate fashion. So that's what I meant by that structure there. So everybody knows the rules of engagement. So those are my initial thoughts. I hope that addresses your question because I'm in this process right now. And in the interest of full disclosure, it was my intent to have that conversation with the board tomorrow, but recognizing that the House bill was introduced, feel that that's important for our board members to be able to have a discussion and take a position. So basically, I held that in abeyance to make room for this important discussion relative to the House bill. So as we look to go forward, looking to resurrect that discussion in the next few weeks, and I'm working in conjunction with the board chairs, I try to get that calendar where we have just an interactive session where we discuss that hopefully turn it over to staff to go out and, you know, uh, throw out some of these ideas and do some collective, you know, outreach so we could discern what our best path is. So thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Some another tech issue. Um, okay, so just to, to I guess circle full circle on that conversation. It sounds like um, there is some, I guess, high level um, alignment um, on in the conversation that we're having around um, flexibility, engagement, just ongoing conversation, and that that's going to transpire um, in the RTD meetings, which are held on on Tuesdays. Is it? I think it's every other week. Um, uh, but but the RTD meetings that uh, on the road to recovery kind of discussion section is kind of when that that conversation will take place, if I'm understanding correctly. If I may clarify, my intent is to have a special session where we talk about that in the sense of being able to engage. So it would okay. be a, at a committee meeting, per se. OK, we would that, note that, of course. Yes, thank you. I okay. was trying to get some clarity and I appreciate that. Okay, wonderful. Um, do we have any other comments um, from the group? I see Jackie has her hand raised. Yeah, I wanted to speak to Elisa's comments regarding getting the uh, private sector involved. And I, Lone Tree has done a really phenomenal job of bringing our private sector business partners to the table. In fact, when we had the fixed route shuttle operating prior to the construction or the completion of the Southeast Rail Extension, we received funding from Health One, Schwab, Kaiser, one of our metro districts that served a business park. And, um, and even those partners uh, contributed dollars actually to the construction of the light rail line in addition to the developer donating the land. We, we had millions of dollars come in from our business partners to support the construction of the Southeast Rail Extension. I think what our business partners need to know is that there's going to be a partnership from RTD and flexibility. So I think it was challenging for them to have such a rigid EcoPass program when they were spending additional dollars to support in their brains uh, RTD and light rail. So they're paying for a shuttle to their door, but there was no flexibility provided to them on an EcoPass program. And so those are the those are the things that I feel like we need to see changing if we are going to be looking to the business community. And the same with um, Denver South. Uh, Denver South TMA is funded through, uh, through property taxes along the business corridor on I-25. So, you know, if we can't give our business community a better return for the dollars they're putting in, um, I think it's hard to ask them to pony up, to continue to pony up money 
to support transit in our communities. And one other example is uh, the Park Meadows Mall Retail Resort. Uh, they really would like to be providing discounted fare tickets to their employees, particularly to the pe people that work there, particularly over the holiday season when parking used to be at a premium pre-COVID. Um, and they did not, you know, they didn't ever feel the love from RTD on that. When they were they're like, we're trying to put people on your rail and you are being very rigid. And this is their words to me, very rigid about how any discounted fare tickets or anything that, uh, it's like, help me help you. And that is what I hear from the business community on my neck of the woods, who I feel have been very generous and very much lean in to support transit and um, light rail uh, in, in the Denver South Corridor. So thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Let's see. I'm not seeing anyone with their hand raised on the chat. I'll just open it up since I am on my phone and I can't exactly see everyone's screen. So I'll just um, see if anyone else wants to chime in before we close this um, part of the conversation out. Crystal, this is um, Dea, I, and then I see Rhett also just raised his hand. Um, I just wanted to jump in to say, I, I think one, the way I'm interpreting this conversation is really that intersection between fares and path structures. How do we make this more flexible, but also how does it connect into the operations and the service delivery of RTD? So it's one thing to have a really flexible fare structure, but at the same time, if the service isn't necessarily there, then it's not meeting the demands of the, the community or meeting the demands of whatever audience we're, we're trying to, to, to get to ride transportation. So um, I definitely see this as a charge of the operations committee and we'll continue to unpack, I think the fares and the path structures, but then also alongside um, service delivery and, and what opportunities might exist there. I just want to make that point. Thank you, Dea. Right. I just want to emphasize that uh, that CEO Johnson has a business to run, and she has a budget to balance. But the new metric is going to be ridership, and and we've got business communities out there that really would like to have passes for their employees, uh, but they need to feel. As Mayor Malay said, they need to feel the love from the RTD side, which historically, I think it's fair to say they haven't as much as they would like to. And so I think there's a great opportunity right now at this period for a, a real change and, and a new level of ridership for RTD way beyond. We, if, if, if ridership's the metric, we're so far down right now, there's only one way to go and that's up. So let's go up. Thanks, Rhett, for the <laughs> call to action there. Um, I, I just wanted to elevate kind of my, what I, what I feel like um, hasn't been said, I guess overtly, I think is kind of interwoven into all of the conversations around kind of the practical part of how um, partnerships evolve. You know, it, it involves collaboration. It involves kind of this stakeholdering process to, you know, build the best solutions. And I think the, the only thing I wanted to add is that you know, RTD, all of that, yes. And then also, I guess the core of maintaining public transit as a public good. Um, you know, I think that can't be, um, at least in my opinion, overstated enough because again, we think about the, the intent of, you know, moving people and, and having this as a public resource um, and, and finding partnerships to be able to still, I guess, hold that, that core mission and value that RTD and, and public transit um, agencies serve in our communities. So um, I, I think that's not been overtly said, but wanted to make sure that we, we call that out as well, because they, you know, it isn't just about like how many partnerships can we have and, you know, budgets and stuff. It, it, is, it is ensuring that, that this remains a, a public resource for, for the public good, right? Right. Um, let's see, look in one more time in the chat, not seeing anyone else, last call. All righty, well, thank you so much um, for the conversation on that item. Um, I know that 
uh, that's going to be an ongoing conversation for sure. So um, our next discussion item is um, around the equity assessment and, and a conversation around contracting. Uh, before I pass the mic on to Matthew, I, I just wanted to preface this and saying, um, I, th I believe it was at a full council or sorry, accountability committee um, where I had kind of mentioned some, some lingering thoughts around um, the way in which we've, we've implemented our equity assessment thus far. And I think um, to um, the credit of RTD, sorry, um, Dr. Cogstaff, um, being able to support this committee in, in writing and, and doing the, our equity assessments, um, but then also wanting to take a step back and thinking about um, systems. We're, we're talking about a system evaluating its own you know, I guess um, practices, and and it, there was just a a concern, and a, and a, I guess I guess more than a concern, a, an interest in wanting to get more subject matter experts involved in the conversation around um, equity, uh, people who really do this um, on a day to day level, who could really just support our processes, since we really are. Um, trying to give input um, on these recommendations um, that may not necessarily be our um, focus, um, I guess, as individuals. So um, that that's, I think, how the conversation uh, ended up on our agenda today. Um, so with that preface, I will hand it off to Matthew to um, talk a little bit about uh, some of our options moving forward. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Matthew Helfant, uh, Senior Transportation Planner, Dr. Cog. Uh, so uh, one of the, uh, since the beginning uh, of this committee, uh, an emphasis has been placed on um, equity and uh, assessing every single recommendation that the committee makes uh, to, uh, to look at uh, uh, the equity implications. And so um, for the first two sets of recommendations, uh, Dr. Cogstaff has used a template that was developed by uh, members of the committee uh, and approved by the committee uh, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to conduct uh, an equity assessment of the first two sets of, of recommendations, the legislative proposal, and also uh, recommendations on how to spend uh, COVID relief uh, stimulus fu uh, funding. Uh, so uh, committee leaders, uh, as has been referenced by uh, the co-chair, um, have requested that for the recommendations included in the final report that this work be uh, done independently uh, by subject matter experts. Uh, and so uh, there are three different options that, that staff uh, uh, have before you today to uh, discuss. Uh, first, um, ask the, the contracted on-call consultants North Highland uh, to do this work, um, uh, take up Mile High Connects on an offer to work with community-based organizations or uh, solicit uh, informal bids uh, for consulting services uh, to do this work. Uh, so um, the proposal that North Highland submitted uh, uh, to um, for on-call on consulting for this committee included expertise in conducting these types of analyses and North Highland uh, uh, will be drafting the content for the final report. So uh, this could easily, uh, this additional work could easily be folded in uh, within the uh, current contract. Um, also, uh, 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 the second option, um, Mile High Connects, uh, 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 a broad uh, partnership of organizations from the private, public, and, and nonprofit sectors uh, that are committed to increasing access to uh, housing choices, good jobs, quality schools, and essential services via public transit um, has uh, offered to, uh, to, do, to do this work pro bono and work with uh, community-based organizations to conduct the equity analysis. Uh, the third option uh, being to solicit informal bids. Uh, as uh, staff believe that the estimated budget for this type of work uh, uh, is below the threshold that requires a full request for proposals, there could be a, a solicitation of um, informal bids. Uh, however, uh, this would take at least a month uh, going from the uh, solicitation uh, through contract execution. And uh, staff would like uh, to, um, for the committee to discuss these three options and uh, give some guidance. 
Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Matthew. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Does anyone want to chime in on um, the three options that are available available to this committee at this point? Crystal? Yes. So he's raising her hand. I just wondered if Daya wanted to expand a little bit more on um, Mile High's generous offer and um, what, if you want to make a pitch for why mm -hmm. it would be useful to use um, community groups in that way. Just love to hear directly from you on that. Yeah, no, thank you, Elise. I was uh, about to raise my hand. So, um, Yes, I, I just wanted to share with the committee um, and with the participants that are on the call. Um, for those of you that don't know, Mile High Connects has a very long history in equity analysis, um, especially working with institutions. And I think we have a wide network to tap into, including um, consultants uh, that we, we can certainly reach out to to support us in this effort. Um, I also just want to uh, stress that Mile High Connects as an organization, you, you know, as Matthew mentioned, is a is a very broad base of community organizations, folks from the philanthropic community, um, as well as uh, financial institutions, um, and those are all members that sit at Mile High Connects on our steering committee, which is essentially our board. Um, but our network really spans across the Denver metro region. Um, we have quite a few partners that do work not only in the Denver, the city and county of Denver, but also um, a lot of partnerships with organizations that do work up, up in Boulder, Longmont, and others. And I think as most folks are aware, uh, Mile High Connects was, has a deep relationship with RTD spanning back to our affordable fares work, which officially launched in 2012. Um, and so not only do we have the internal relationships with RTD, but also the external relationships with partners. Um, and so really the offer um, to support the RTD Accountability Committee with this equity um, assessment is really rooted in our belief that um, in order for um, policies and, and government institutions to really meet the needs of community, we need to center a community voice in that process. And so we were really, I, I was really interested in supporting um, the work of this uh, accountability committee in authentically engaging community in a conversation around equity and, and the recommendations that we're putting forward to ensure it's meeting the overall objectives. So I'm happy to answer questions or talk more about Mile High Connects <laughs> if folks have any questions. Thank so, you, Daya. Hey, Krista uh, or Daya, could, could one of y'all explain to me a little bit better? I, I don't think I understand what we're asking for. Okay. Yeah, so happy to you elaborate. You can, Maybe I'm sorry, did you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I was just going to ask, I don't know, Christopher, I think we kind of talked over each other. If you guys could, can someone elaborate? We're having a study done to tell the accountability committee what the status of diversity initiatives are at RTD, or is this something that we're suggesting RTD do, or is it something else in between? No, it, I'm happy to elaborate, Chris. Sorry if that wasn't clear to anyone um, else. Um, so the, the equity assessment actually was um, something that we had, as you know, um, committed to from the get-go. We had an, a, a group of volunteers from this committee help um, put together kind of this uh, equity framework and lens that we were going to evaluate all of our recommendations by. And so we've done that thus far with our recommendations, but it's been um, Dr. Cog's staff um, doing a lot of the legwork in, cons in consultation with the committee and kind of that subgroup. And so part of this was recognizing that we have a short amount of time left, but that we have many recommendations that we need to go through. And so um, trying to balance um, the, I guess, feasibility of that, as well as recognizing that, though I think um, we had all agreed on that structure, that framework, and having um, RTD being kind of the backbone there, that there could be a better way to give input on the equitable impacts of our recommendation. So, you know, not that we control necessarily the decision making around some of our recommendations, but our, our recommendations have consequences and that that is both positive and negative. Um, and, you know, the, the recommendations aren't so binary, right, because there's, I think, a lot of gray area, but having an opportunity to formally record, discuss um, and share um, what those considerations will look like, because 
we're just, I think the start where we're this, or this convening body that has conversations around recommendations, but we can't actually implement these. So um, it being also a tool for folks who pick up our work and, you know, obviously RTD has really been integral into our process. So supporting um, the, the process moving forward after our conversation is over. Is that um, a little more clear, Chris? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Could I add a little bit to that, Crystal? Yes, go ahead. I just think also that um, we're trying to model best practices in terms of doing equity assessments of, uh, of work and, and trying to view our recommendations through the lens of equity. That's something that the legislature is, is trying to do more of. And, and I think one of the best practices is not for um, us to make recommendations and say, hey, we took a look at our own recommendations and we think they're great and they'll be really good for equity, but to ask people who are experts and in, in the community, what do you think of our draft recommendations? Could you do an assessment of equity? So it's, it's more valid, there's better buy-in and there's better process if you ask the third party in the community to reflect back to you on whether or not the recommendations are equity. So we've we've been doing it ourselves, and we and I think we've done a pretty good job. But it's not a best practice to evaluate your own work and, and decide that it's good. So, so at least that's something I, I thought that was I was really intrigued as you were going along there. And I apologize if I'm derailing us. I, I really don't mean to. You said that we'll get the community's feedback and or buy in on on this process and our recommendations. So. Um, and well, you could weigh in. I don't really know what that looks like. Well, let me let me be more precise. We are going to get the community's feedback on our recommendations writ large when we hold a public hearing, which we are required to do. Separate from that, when we're looking through an equity lens, it is helpful for people who are experts in the community who in equity and, and have that lived experience to actually look at our recommendations and mirror back to us whether or not they're gonna have good, bad or otherwise impacts on equity. That's what I meant. Um, I gotcha, okay. Sorry if I was uh, imprecise. I, and to add to that, I think um, the how, Chris, is kind of um, a, a, bringing us back to the conversation that we're having today. So I think how we and who we engage with in order to um, support that equity assessment is kind of, I think the answer to the question um, that, that you're asking about, how do we do that? And, um, you know, Dea just made the, the pitch per se around, you know, using Mile High Connects to do this. And I think what I, what I heard um, her elaborate on is that, I mean, by design, Mile High Connects is already a broad coalition of organizations from across industries and sectors who um, focus and, and already center equity in, in the way that they make decisions and, and do work, um, and that they have a robust network of you know, locally based organizations that they already tap into to already to do that work. And so by them taking this on, they, they would kind of plug us into kind of their um, network and of course they you know there there would be some back and forth um, to be determined I'm sure but um, it sounds like that that is their process I am going to make an assumption that North Highland would also you know connect um, with different organizations and make the same kind of um, uh, I guess work out of out of this process but um, and now that I am saying that do we have anyone from North Highland on on the call by chance? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Crystal, we, um, Crystal, this is Ron. We do. Uh, Tanya okay. Edelman is on, and I'll allow her to talk if you wanted to ask her a question. Yeah, I, I wonder if she might also want the opportunity um, to say a little bit about um, the their process, you know, and, and what this could look like. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Hi, this is Tanya Eidelman with North Highland. Thank you very much for, for um, having us join today. Um, so I, I will say we do not have our subject matter experts um, on the call here today, but um, we do have access to subject matter experts within our firm. 
um, that, that do this type of work um, and some of whom are, are based locally there in Colorado. Um, and we have looked at the um, template that has already been used and have passed that along to, to our subject matter experts to see how that can be leveraged moving forward. Thank you, Tanya. Sure. So, you know, again, the, the conversation today is um, recognizing that we kind of need to make a decision soon, um, considering we have a short amount of time. Um, the, those are the, the two options, you know, working with the, the folks we have already um, agreed to work with uh, through North Highland on our on-call um, contracting basis, working with Mile High Connects, um, and then the third one is to solicit informal bids. Um, you know, just recentering our three options there. I know we've had a chance to hear from two, two of the folks there. Um, and I am seeing that there are hands to raise as a result. So I will just go down the line on my list. Apologies if this isn't the accurate order. Uh, Chris, you're first on my list. That's an accident. I'm just here to torture you, Crystal. <laughs> no, no, no hard questions from you. Um, Rut. Yeah, I, I would say uh, just looking at the three options, to me, the idea of going out for bid and spending a month on that, we've got we've got a couple of good good alternatives here. I would hope the rest of the committee agrees that that's probably not the best route to go. Um, I I do uh, believe that if you look at Mile High Connects, they already have all the connections with all the communities that are the critical critical uh, input to this process. And it would, it would seem that, that we can have a fair level of confidence that they would be able to do that job well. It's also important, I think, to have those same communities involved in looking at our recommendations because when we are no longer here, which isn't that far in the future, it would help RTD to have had their input and to have, make them feel like they've had a say in, in all of this and these recommendations. So uh, uh, the, the last thing I wanna say is that I think we need to uh, continue uh, to have a, a, a one level with Matthew review of this process and our recommendations as it goes on. He may spot some things before we send these official recommendations out that really could help us as well. So uh, I think he's done a great job so far and I would hate to not have him engaged in a subject like this of which he has a fairly high level of expertise as a first filter on that process. But I, uh, you know, I really enjoyed working with, with uh, North Highland. Uh, they've done a lot of good work for us in the finance committee. This just seems like something we're engaging uh, Mile High Connects with all of their expertise and connections in this makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Rhett. Uh, Rebecca. Uh, just a, a, mostly a clarifying question on my part, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but we do have the capacity within the North Highland contract to add on this additional work, right? I'm not clear to me how much we've spent so far, and but I know we didn't have a very large budget there. Capacity. And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I believe that's the case. I wanted to um, give Dr. Cog the opportunity to chime in um, on additional information on where we're at there. We do have the, the capacity. Um, it, it, could, it could be folded in to um, a task order with, um, with North, North Highland um, doing the drafting the content. Uh, so it would it'd make it a little bit extra but uh, staff believes that we have the capacity to add it. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Rebecca, for that clarification. Okay. Any, any other discussion on, on this item, on, on which uh, of the three options we should take? Could I ask a clarification of Dr. Cog on that? Um, if we added this to the North Highland contract, would that pretty much um, uh, take up all of their capacity and funding for the remainder of this project? Or are there still 
is, would they have still some ability to, to look at additional questions as they come up? Um, right now, we're, we're working with North Highland staff on some additional task orders. Uh, I already mentioned the, um, the content for the uh, final report, but also uh, helping out with um, the, um, the dashboard and um, the uh, performance measures associated with that, as well as some additional work for the governance committee. Uh, so um, regardless, uh, we, if, if North Highland doesn't do the, um, the, uh, the equity assessment, we would have a little bit of room, but not much. But regardless, it looks like uh, pretty much everything is in the current contract, the current budget, would be would be spent regardless. But let me just Sorry. hear what I thought I heard you saying is basically if you look at our work plan, the committee's work plan and the remaining work that we might need North Highlands to do, they're able to do that and potentially an equity assessment as well. That would take all the funds, but it would it's basically all the work we think we need from them. I'm just trying to see if there's an opportunity cost here that we need to be aware of or not. Well, if if North Highland does not do the equity assessment, there would be a little bit left in the budget, um, probably approximately uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for any additional work. Thanks for that clarification. So, Crystal. Um, I, I have my hand up, I promise. I don't know if you I can see, see it. it. Uh, I, I mean, I kind of agree with Rut, Rut's comment. I don't think it makes sense to go out and solicit additional bids for this. I think given uh, Elise, the great points Elise just highlighted with the fact that I'd rather retain the budget for, for something else when we've got a great local partner uh, that has willing to do this pro bono for us that is already engaged in the community. So I guess uh, in looking for, a, I don't know if we want a recommendation or a motion or whatever, but I, I, whatever we need, I'm, I'm suggesting we move forward with a very generous offer uh, with Mile High Connects to move to, to uh, with, with the understanding that Matthew will be engaged in the process as well. I think that was another great point that Rut raised. So that, that's throwing that out for the body as a motion to react to. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, before we act on that, um, Kristen, um, oh, yeah, okay, so time check, it's 9.53. Um, so we're gonna have to get through these next comments rather quickly uh, before we um, take an action on this. Uh, Kristen, did you wanna chime in real quick? 15 seconds, not that I'm without bias because I do have a bias towards my high connects. I do believe that they would be the best choice of these three. Okay. They have everything is already built in to what My High Connects does. So let them continue with their work. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, did you have anything you needed clarification or any comments? Uh, a suggestion. I wonder if perhaps there's a bit of a hybrid where Mile High does this work, but we ask for uh, a review from North Highlands just based on their experience around the nation. To add in, or just to, and that I, I doubt that would be very expensive. Yeah. A, Go ahead, Matthew. I was just going to say, if that's the committee's preference, then we can certainly have those uh, conversations with both organizations. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly from Daya um, thoughts on on that potential collaboration between the two organizations. And I see that you are abstaining um, from the vote either way, just given your role with Mile High Connects. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, um, Rebecca, and I appreciate the recommendation. Um, I, I do acknowledge that while Mile High Connects has has um, experience in advocating for affordable transit, we are by no means experts. <laughs> and so um, I do think that makes a lot of sense and I can certainly coordinate with North Highlands and Matthew on that. Okay, wonderful. Rut, I <laughs> got a lot of airtime today. Did you wanna add anything um, substantial um, to the conversation at this point? Well, I, I would like to offer the, the friendly amendment to Jackie's uh, moving uh, to that we go ahead 
uh, to have North Highlands do a brief overview of it at the end. And with that, if she accepts that friendly amendment, I move that I second her motion. Um, just a quick check. Uh, are we, do we need a formal motion for this recommendation? Doesn't hurt. <laughs> I think that would be nice actually to do that. Alrighty, then we'll, we'll do that. Um, it sounds like there is a friendly amendment to a proposed motion. Does the originating uh, member uh, acquiesce to that uh, suggestion? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So there is a motion to um, move forward with um, uh, Mile High Connects uh, collaborating with North Highland. Um, can I get a show of yays or hands raised um, in support of that motion or, well, in support, okay. Any opposed? I might ask you to say that all out, out loud since I'm having to scroll through all these different screens. I, I think it's unanimous with okay. Daya uh, abstaining. Wonderful, thank you for being and Chris dancing. Eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there was some dancing apparently. All right, let's uh, let the official record reflect that. Um, and on that note, I, uh, thank you everyone for the robust discussion on that. I'm really excited to um, see that that's the direction. I had my own inclination that I didn't want to, you know, um, influence the conversation too much, but I'm, I'm really glad that we were all on the same page there. Um, we have administrative items. Do we have any member comments or other matters that we need to address at this time, um, either from um, committee members or from Dr. Cog's staff. Not hearing any, and I don't believe I see any. Wonderful. And I guess on that note, uh, we have three minutes back to your day. Uh, thank you all for uh, a good, robust conversation this morning. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. You're adjourned.